Nearly all of us are somewhat disoriented by an element of mystery. The unknown most frequently creates fear in us. The everyday, the commonplace, the expected may be difficult, but we're sort of braced for them. But always we are at a disadvantage when we find ourselves involved in a mystery. We like mystery stories for late reading, but we do not want to have the circumstances occur to us. Actually, we are born into a world that must remain mysterious to us as long as we live. The course of life is a mystery which we seldom completely solve, and we depart from here into another mystery about which we have only certain vague convictions. Perhaps it is because man has never been able to solve the life he lives. That mystery has always been a cause of apprehension. He has lived in dread of the unexpected, of the fatalities which seem to lurk around the corners of the future. And even as we have developed into a more highly civilized group, we are not able to face the unknown with very much internal security. If we feel that we have accomplished something in this direction and are a little proud of ourselves, let us pause and consider the, how we feel at that moment when we have a very late phone call in the night. Do we expect to receive good news? We begin to wonder who is sick, who is dead, and what has gone wrong. When the uh, messenger brings a telegram to the front door, we usually have a bad moment before we open it. It is not likely to our thinking that we're going to have any very good news unless we really know what is uh, the nature of the telegram in advance. Uh, we, we simply cannot face uh, the uncertain without a kind of weakness in the pit of the stomach. So many things could go wrong. Some individuals have this feeling stronger than others. Some live their entire lives in an almost constant state of fear. It becomes habitual. They instinctively expect disaster and are rather disappointed sometimes when it does not appear to meet their expectations. Looking back over a long period of years, if we could remember each of these little episodes, I think we would find considerable encouragement. Many of the uh, terrible things that were about to happen never occurred. Many of these messages and phone calls were good news. Uh, the individual was a little late coming home and caused us anxiety, generally arrived. Most of the time, it isn't what happens. It's this strange, deep, negative concern that gets us into uh, some of these periods of depression. Faced, therefore, with the realization that instinctively we are afraid of the hole in the dark, there seems to be no way in which we can counteract this condition except through a planned program of self-re-education. There's no use denying intellectually these negative feelings. 
When the crisis arrives, we seldom have any opportunity to intellectualize it. The impact occurs before we realize that we are vulnerable, and then we are frightened again. Somewhere along the way, each individual has to solve in a reasonable manner his relationships with circumstances that he cannot foretell. He has to be prepared for the tomorrow, uh, which remains to a measure always mysterious. He can only take consolation in the fact that yesterday, today was mysterious. And yet most individuals have come through it to some measure of security. We do not know exactly everything that has contributed to the rise of mystery in relation to man, but we know basically that the mystery is in man. Mystery is an attitude. Actually, there is nothing mysterious in a, university, in a universe that is ruled by law. There can be much that is not known. But the fact that it is not known does not mean that it is uh, an impending disaster. To try and work out some harmonious relationship with change, with the inevitable vicissitudes of life, we have to have a philosophy of some kind. And this philosophy has to gradually, through application, become a part of our own natures. Just as surely as fear is an autosuggestive process, making negation ever more easy for us to accept. So mystery is a concept, it is an attitude, it is an approach to things, and because it is not a healthy attitude, it can have many unhappy consequences. Once this attitude becomes habitual and the unknown is ever menacing, we have taken a great deal of joy out of life, we have impaired health, we have interfered with the natural development of our careers, and we have worked many hardships on those around us. So we must try to do something to get out of this cycle of misgiving this cycle of perpetual anxiety about most everything that happens. One way to approach this problem, certainly, is to attempt in a quiet time when no emergency is impending, to rationalize our own relationships with circumstances realizing that these circumstances are of themselves not always congenial to our own desires. We are going in one way, and perhaps the world is going in another direction. This means inevitably that there will be times when the inconsistencies between our own conduct and the natural patterns of things will bring some form of punishment uh, to us. Whenever there is a negative situation, it represents a kind of reminder that there's something wrong in our own approach to things. If this were not true, uh, there would be no solution. But in nature, there is always a solution. A man has been endowed with the power to overcome fear, and mystery in his own nature. It is always something that arises out of his own relationship with the world around him. Actually, of course, uh, mystery is pretty deep in our organisms. We have inherited it from hundreds of thousands of years of anxieties of our ancestors. We see more and more justification in anxiety as we watch world conditions around us. 
We never know when we wake up in the morning what the news will be. We never know how conditions in general are going to affect us in particular. There seems to be a continuous tendency for pressures uh, to work hardships on persons. Knowing this pattern to be as it is, we recognize the importance of adjustments and acceptances and the integration of our lives around the expectancy for the unexpected. We live in a world in which everything changes. The securities that we have known slip away. The insecurities that we fear also slip away. Each day brings a new relationship between the individual and the pattern of life along which he is moving. So we'll start in now by trying to analyze this mystery factor a little more carefully in terms of human uh, faculties and powers. Actually, man's mind is capable of two processes which bear upon this issue. One is his inevitable ability to sense that there is a future. Many creatures probably are not possessed with the power to realize that there will be a tomorrow. Therefore, they live in a condition of immediacy. As animals, they live only in the terms of the moment. If they are alive at the moment, they are alive. If the animal kingdom had possessed the power to recognize the inevitability of tomorrow, it might long ago have annihilated man because it would have begun to plan and it might well have outplanned man if we are to estimate by man's present level of planning which is not exactly adequate. The next point that man has of importance to this factor is that he has imagination. Imagination, therefore, does something with this sense of tomorrowness. If a man realizes that he is apt to be here tomorrow, he may wonder what he will be doing tomorrow. This suggests to him that tomorrow may confront him with some of the perplexities and anxieties that are carried forward from today. Uh, today his bills are 30 days overdue, which is a cause of problem. Tomorrow they will be 31 days overdue, and what does this mean in terms of possible further difficulties? Also on the time payment basis, there is a tomorrow every 30 days that can be a cataclysm. So the individual has these faculties. He um, realizes that there can be a tomorrow, he suspects that tomorrow may be loaded with the unfinished business that he has procrastinated from today and yesterday. And he is also uh, concerned with the fact that this tomorrow uh, may present a new relationship with life in total. What is the world going to be tomorrow? Now, tomorrow is not just a day for the average person. Tomorrow is future. And as conditions become more difficult, we become more afraid of the future. And the more we mortgage it, the more frightened we become of it. The more we push of, of unfinished business into the future, the larger the mass of negative anxieties about the future will become. So in a sense, man is moving along like a snowplow, trying to push disaster in front of him, never realizing that it must inevitably catch up with him, but always suspecting that this might happen. This is enough to give anyone insomnia. <laughs> so one way of uh, working with the future is to empty it as far as possible of past pressures. 
The individual who paid his bills today is not going to worry about the bill collector tomorrow. The individual who improves himself today has a greater opportunity for optimism about tomorrow. The person who trains himself for a future employment that is better than he now has is in a more secure position than the individual who only wishes he had a better training and faces a tomorrow in which there are many negative uncertainties. Thus, one way to approach the whole problem of mystery is to empty it as far as possible of all of its negative content. We do this in a great many different ways with different problems. As children grow up, it becomes obvious that their own individual lives will become more important to them and they will slip out from under our domination. We have to prepare ourselves for this experience rather than to wait breathlessly for the sad day when they walk out and start their own careers. If we do not adjust, we will very likely badger these children until they leave home earlier than they might otherwise have done. Our anxieties are not nice for other people to live with, and the more anxious we become to hold on to someone, the more anxious they will be to escape. So our anxiety uh, does not pay off. It brings us nothing uh, but fear for that day to come when some such disaster as this will suddenly strike us. We do not know when it will happen, but when the daughter elopes, it has happened. <laughs> and how are we going to face it? almost entirely according to what we have built up in advance for this situation. If we have no strength, no security, and sense this occur occasion as the final consummation of a long expected misfortune, then we are in a very poor condition uh, to adjust our lives to these inevitable changes. The psychology has pointed out that the most difficult thing in all the world to live with is the unknown. Yet because we have to live with it, we have to adjust our own natures uh, to certain things uh, and certain patterns that very likely will arise. One thing that we have to adjust to is change. But well, one of the fears of tomorrow is that the things that we know and the things that we believe and the things we enjoy will be taken from us. Some individuals fear progress simply because it is a constant challenge uh, to a series of uncomfortable adjustments. We really do not want progress as much as we want comfort. Progress usually forces us to do things we do not desire to do. Therefore, it becomes a constant hazard to the securities of life. The great growth of freeways has taken away from tens of thousands of persons their homes and gardens. To these people, this is not progress. This is disaster as individuals. Things that they have built and planned and struggled for for years suddenly disappear. And there seems to be no just compensation for these dilemmas. Thus, every change that occurs in our world can affect us. We watch with serious concern uh, the constant uh, compa combat of powers in this world. We see na uh, national difficulties and international uh, tragedies, and we cannot but therefore feel each morning that we pick up the newspaper that we are going to hear bad news. And the newspaper, which is largely a recording of bad news, seldom disappoints us. 
there is always murder, rape, and carnage of some kind on the front page, and any cheerful note that might exist has only two lines under the obituary notices. We cannot uh, escape these implications. They become habitual. So we finally develop a certain interest in this bad news. It becomes something to have with the boiled eggs and toast in the morning to sort of start the day. It is the keynote. And after we have received the keynote message, we are ready to go out and worry ourselves to death. There's no use telling the average person that there are any certainties about the future. He will not believe you, and he will bring a great deal of evidence to prove that he is right. But the whole problem finally becomes a matter of his own thinking and of our own thinking. As the old philosophers used to say, that things are not really good or bad, but thinking makes them so. And wherever we find a tendency to exaggerate our morbid attitudes, we have to take hold of the situation or we will become, obviously, um, psychotic. There's something will build within ourselves that is hard to live with and very difficult to reform once it is established. If we begin, however, by going back, as the old philosophers sort of suggested, and establishing foundations, we may still have to face things that we do not enjoy, but perhaps we will face them with a different attitude of mind, and this is very important. The religious person is not always in the best spot to approach this situation, unfortunately, because religion itself has so often taught man to fear the unknown. Uh, for every soul that ultimately rests in some paradisical sphere, uh, the religious teaching intimates that a great many are going to end in perdition, which is itself a slight cause of anxiety. For some reason, however, man as a group has worried less about the possibilities of ultimate damnation than he has about tomorrow and the immediate problems of life. I think down somewhere in man's subconscious nature, uh, he has rejected the idea of eternal damnation. It really doesn't operate very powerfully. He is much more worried over the foreclosure of the mortgage. <laughs> but even in this level, there has been a lot of negative thinking. Uh, to a man, deity has very often appeared uh, as a very dangerous power in nature. Uh, deity has sent afflictions, according to uh, Job and several other authorities, uh, which have been extremely difficult for man to bear, and as Job finally decided, that uh, there did not seem to be any particular constructive pattern behind this divine process of afflicting mankind. These afflictions were sent at the whim of deity, or perhaps to test man. Well, man finally grew a little weary of so much testing. It became uh, a, a cause of continual anxiety to him. So religion has not always been very comforting. It has warned him, it has frightened him, it has persuaded him, and it has bullied, bullied him. But he still remains very much the same. Better, perhaps, therefore, than popular theology, as we have known it, is the deeper religious philosophy, which has tried to explain things has tried to make the universe appear reasonable to the average reasonable person. And this is perhaps about the beginning of our problem. If man uh, believes scientifically, as he seems to believe, uh, that he can depend upon the orderliness of the universe, 
that whether we understand it or not, creation itself unfolds according to exact rules and patterns. This is a great help, because where exactness exists, there is less fear of mystery. Exactness means that in some strange way, the universe is moving through space in a vast pageantry of purposes. We may not know what these purposes are, but the relentless way in which the universe continues would give us some hope that the universe does know, that it is not merely a series of interrelated accidents. We do not see much evidence of accident in nature, perhaps a little due to the tempests and tornadoes of our own planet, but for the great pattern of nature, we do not see too much accident. We see, rather, the continual unfolding of purposes. There seems also no reason to assume what perhaps got theologians into trouble, no reason to assume that man is apart from nature. This was one of his mistakes. He seemed to feel that he was an orphan, that in some mysterious way he was different from the universe around him. And because he was different, he could not follow the simple rules of other things. And because he had a mind, he had to use this forever to complicate his own affairs. If we can begin to think of man as part of nature, as part of the universe, as one of the innumerable forms of life and energy moving through space, and that all this movement is controlled by law, by the reasonable purposes of values which we cannot fully understand. If we can begin to sense this in some way, then these values which we cannot understand, while they are unknown, do not carry with them the negative pressure of mystery as we understand it today. There are these natural mysteries, but actually, these natural mysteries are not any more dangerous than the things that we know. Uh, the unknown is therefore merely, to the philosopher, the extensions of the reasonable processes of things known. Uh, tomorrow, the sun will rise again, because that is the way in which nature set up the pattern. These natural things we accept, we are not frightened by them, unless by some circumstance we have gotten ourselves into a situation in which the rising of the sun is dangerous to us. This is the situation that we have created. If we have become lost in a desert, the rising of the sun can be a symbol of great tragedy to us. But for millions of others, it is the beginning of another day of useful experience. So our own adjustment to these things has much to do with whether uh, the patterns of nature are useful or dangerous to us. Having established some foundation on the acceptance that nature knows what it is doing, that man is part of nature, and for that part of natural plan which man does not understand, he must depend upon nature, with the simple security that nature is not a mysterious evil, that nature is not a terrible adversary with which we must lock ourselves all the time. Nature is ourselves. Nature is the very substance of our own existence. We are part of it. We move with it. And as long as we are harmonious to its purposes, it probably will not do us any greater harm uh, than the common experiences which we set up among ourselves and for which we have ready explanation and uh, constant defense patterns. 
Having sense, therefore, that perhaps we are part of a natural process, we can lean on this process to a certain measure, and we can begin to view the universe around us not as an area of evil populated with goblins, but as a natural unfolding course of procedure, a great road leading through the stars and a great army of evolving existences continually passing along this road on their inevitable journey to the fulfillment of the purpose for which they were fashioned. If we can get a little of this problem uh, set into the picture, uh, it will help a great deal. The next point that probably has a bearing upon man's concept of things is the relationship of cause and effect in our own conduct. It is true that what we call mystery is perhaps only unexplained a lawful circumstance. We think of mystery as the unexpected, but under our pattern of conduct, what right have we to say that a variety of circumstances, good or evil, can really be considered unexpected. The individual who uh, perhaps drinks a little too much and is involved in, a, in an automobile accident, has he any right to consider this accident unexpected? Actually, he has been causing it carefully and systematically for years, and finally it caught up with him. If he had not allowed alcoholism to creep into his daily practices, uh, he might then not have suffered from this particular accident. So a great many things that we call unexpected are the natural, reasonable consequences of our own conduct. In the future, then, in this vacuum which we call mystery, there must be a place for the rewards and punishments for our own conduct. Perhaps this is one of the things that makes it all very dismal. We are not nearly certain that this process of reward and punishment is going to be overwhelmingly enjoyable. We are not sure that our rewards are equal in number to the chastisements that we should receive. We know that we are foolish every day, and it is not always pleasant to look forward to a harvest from folly sometime in the future. So another pattern which philosophy has reminded us, uh, reminded us of is that the more we can organize and integrate our present patterns, uh, the more optimism we may feel toward the future. It would seem that if the person has earned a good future, he will receive it, whether he knows what it is going to be or not. He can take certain solid consolation in the fact that he has sowed a good harvest, and in the probabilities he will reap it. Whereas if he has sown little, or a bad harvest, or has caused weeds to continue in his garden, he has very little to look forward to in hope for future things. Now this goes for a certain way and runs against an obstacle which man himself recognizes, and that is that there are instances in human life in which it appears uh, that some strange fatal force interferes with what would seem to be a good pattern, that the individual tries very hard does things as honestly and wisely as he knows, and is still suddenly confronted with disaster. 
that there does not seem to be an inevitable relationship between a good effort and a good result. This is true, but such instances seem to be of the minority. I think we can say that if the individual will clean house today, that the chances are that he will have a pretty decent tomorrow. But this is not inevitably the case. And we have to try to understand in a lawful universe what these exceptions arise from. Well, there are at least two, perhaps more probable causes for exceptions. The first is the most obvious, namely that the individual who has tried his best was not sufficiently equipped to make a decision that was adequate. He did his best, but his best was not good enough to protect him from negative consequences. His best was therefore not a wise best, but a best perhaps based on too many personal pressures, too many personal antagonisms, or too many factors around which uh, centers of pressure were built due to his own ignorance. Consequently, the person who does the best he can uh, cannot expect uh, to have a security uh, greater than that which his common sense and his abilities have actually made possible. The individual, out of the very best of motives and with the kindest of intentions, spoils a child. If you look down through the pattern, you are impressed with the fact of the continuing kindliness of the parent. But the parent was weak and, for one reason or another, failed to administer discipline when it was needed perhaps because the parent did not understand discipline themselves. So kindness, while it seems to be a virtuous attitude, has to be philosophized before it is valuable. Kindness in this instance would have been to discipline the child, and this was not done. So then the parent who has given all for the child wonders why the child is not grateful. There has been an error in judgment, although good intention dominated the, sub the substance of the action. Now this good intention has its proper reward, but the error of judgment has its proper penalties, and these cannot be avoided. So the person who did the best he can may still be faced with difficulties if that best isn't good enough. The second point that arises in the situation is one that has been strongly emphasized in Oriental philosophy, namely the operation of the law of karma. To get the universe into some kind of a reasonable pattern, it seems absolutely necessary to assume that the individual has brought a burden of unfinished business into his present embodiment from somewhere. He has not come into the world the clean, fresh, innocent creature that he may appear to be. And as we watch children growing up today, we observe that the pressures of their own temperaments are obvious almost from infancy. The child is born an individual, is born with tendencies and pressures, is born with uh, combinations of optimism and pessimism, is born with insight and blind spots. And in spite of anything we may do, we may influence this child to a degree, but it has a hard core of its own existence, which we can do very, very little about. As the child grows up, very wise handling will help. But even the wisest of handling will not always accomplish the desired end, because we cannot grow for someone else. So the individual coming into the world brings with him something 
uh, in a nature or temperament which is itself the cause of certain future disasters or dilemmas for that individual. Even though he might uh, be able to live this life without making a serious mistake, he may be penalized for the unfinished business of the past. Somewhere, uh, apparently, he has stored up um, situations that must exhaust themselves in the present embodiments, perhaps even in future ones. So there seems to be this long-range problem which he cannot completely, completely avoid. But for practical purposes, we can say that the integration of his present life around some intelligent focal point will accomplish two things. It will reduce the hazards of the unknown uh, very, very greatly, so that instead of perpetual emergencies, we may face only two or three in the course of a lifetime that have great reality. The second thing it will do through our own inner growth is to give us the insight to accept these things that cannot be avoided, to recognize that while they may appear to be uh, complete uh, accidents in nature, that actually in some way whatever comes to us belongs to us. It has been earned, it has been deserved, or it could not happen. Thus, the sense of unfairness or unreasonableness, this belief that we are the victim of some form of sidereal accident, this, having been, this belief having been removed, uh, we are more likely to face the emergency with responsibility and thoughtfulness because we know that it is lawfully our own, whether we like it or not. Therefore in, the, therefore, in the future, we have the rising shadows of these various factors, the largest and most menacing being uh, the natural result of causes we have uh, set in motion, and the more remote one being these inevitable bills that still have to be paid. Society, as we have built it up today, is not based upon any philosophic insight into anything. It is built upon an endless pattern of emergencies and expediencies. Therefore, the, up, the training we receive, the indoctrination that comes to us in the course of ordinary living, these are of very little help. The individual cannot drift with his times unless he is willing to drift into the dilemma of his times. There is no solution here. Each person must create for himself an insight great enough to sustain him, and it must in many instances uh, be diametrically opposed to prevailing procedures. Unless he has the courage and the strength, therefore, to live his own life and create his own philosophy of life, he can never be sure of having any better destiny than that which is uh, the experience of others around him. Now, ahead of man also in the universe, if we are to believe na a natural procedure in any way, must certainly unfold a pattern of betterness Things must be better than they at first appear to us. If this existence, of which we are a small part, has any purpose at all, this purpose is improvement of some kind. It is growth, unfoldment, adjustment, fulfillment, the perfection of something. Consequently, the unknown future of things in its long-range pattern has to be better than the present, although it may not appear to be at any given moment. Actually, the greatest worry that we have uh, should be this lingering past in us, 
rather than anxiety about the future. Actually, the future is only another step in the experiencing of universal purpose. Tomorrow we will have another lesson, and we are fortunate indeed if we enjoy scholarship. Otherwise, these lessons become merely painful experiences to be endured without understanding. Mystery is where we are bewildered by these things. When we are punished and do not know why, the punishment is of slight value to us. We all feel that this happens. We never do know why some of these things seem to happen. The reason for this not knowing is we've never really tried to find out. Nature has adapted our mechanisms so that we could find out if we want to. But a person who has spent their entire lifetime avoiding the responsibilities of thinking will not in a critical moment have very much equipment with which to estimate the reason for what happens. And most persons simply do not try to find out. They would prefer the mystery, because to them the mystery places them in a relation of martyrdom to the circumstance. It is much easier to open one's hands uh, with a sad and depressed expression and say, I just don't know why it happened. This causes the individual to look as though he was the victim of a brutal circumstance in nature. He was a poor little innocent creature minding his own business and doing the best he could, and suddenly the sky fell on him. This is a much more satisfactory attitude. We like to feel that we are abused. And if there's any way of maintaining this feeling, with any degree of comfort at all, we will do so, (laughs) even at some discomfort. But you take the person who starts out in life. Uh, They uh, began by experiencing the world around them. They learned to reach up to doorknobs, and they learned to walk, and they learned to uh, get some sense of relationship between their own uh, little growing natures and the world in which they lived. Then they went to school. They didn't do anything special in school. If they graduated years ago, they knew how to read and write. Now they're not doing so well. (laughs) But anyway, what did they learn to read and write? They learned to read and write in order that they could uh, express their own opinions and become aware of other people's. This was very largely the procedure. They got into higher education. By this time, it was important to decide on a career. So the individual had to work out whether he was going to graduate from high school and go into the trades or crafts or go on to college and enter the professions. By the time he made up his mind on one of these or completed it and done his two years in the army, he was ready to get married. After he got married, he took on responsibilities. From that time on, he became increasingly afraid to think. He didn't dare to uh, differ from the boss or he'd lose the job. He had to begin to settle down, as he calls it. Settle down, meaning in this instance, to close his mind to anything except adjustment with immediate circumstances. After a certain number of years, he finally got his children educated and got them started in the same pattern he had been in and began to think of retirement. In the course of thinking of retirement, he decided what he was going to do. And if he, was managed, if he managed to talk himself out of one of these old folks' retirement plans, he then began to think of what he would like to do. There's that little hobby shop. Or if he was a man of extraordinary mental genius, he decided to spend the rest of his life paying, playing golf. These are the things that uh, 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 concerned him. Then, perhaps, just as he got to playing pretty fair golf, the sky fell on him. The greatest catastrophe of all, he had a stroke and couldn't play golf anymore. (laughs) This ended his life because he had nothing else. 
Now, on a person of this kind, living this way, drifting from day to day, small talk and shopping, making up life, when this person faces an emergency, what do they have to face it with? If this individual has to suddenly make a very vital decision, how are they going to make it? Well, people have different ways of trying to make it these days. They go to their clergyman and ask him his opinion. But he has much help. He never made a decision in his life himself. <laughs> then uh, he goes perhaps to a psychologist and says, uh, I have to make a, a very important decision. The psychologist says, you know, I, I'm having about the same decision. How are you feeling about it? <laughs> so he goes to his lawyer. And the lawyer says, well, you have no case. Wait till the man steals it. Then you can do something. <laughs> and so it goes. No one really knows how to make these decisions. And then they wonder why things go bad afterwards. The future, therefore, is simply, in many instances, a monument to present futility. Nothing has been solved. Nature says something has to be solved. Consequently, it keeps on pestering us with this unfinished business until we do something about it. And if in desperation we do something wrong about it, then nature not only pesters us with the same unfinished business, but throws in a penalty because we have done it wrong. Nature has to do this, or man would never in all eternity ever do anything right. He does not want to assume responsibility for his own life, and nature says he has to. And this struggle has gone on since the dawn of time. It follows that the idea we had 20 years ago that philosophy was just a nasty word is not true. Without some kind of integration around some point of growing knowledge within ourselves, we can never face tomorrow with a good hope. We will always be dumping into the future the unfinished business of today. As time goes on, this stack gets too big. It begins to landslide back into the present again. And every day we wake up, we have a heavier burden of things that should have been taken care of long ago. Keeping this going this way year after year does create for us a great deal of anxiety about what lies ahead. There is no doubt that gradually we build up uh, such a mass of indebtedness to life that we have to face it. We have to pay it off sometime. This is perhaps the reason why we are always suspecting the worst. We have an internal instinct that we deserve the worst. And the cure to this is to gain the instinct that we deserve the best. And to do this, we must prepare and earn the best that it is possible for us to achieve. The individual who is constantly under the pressure, therefore, of natural law has a tendency to apply the concept of this pressure to everything around him. He sees the universe as a possible source of danger and of hazard. He sees every situation that arises uh, as a potential destroyer of his own peace of mind. We had no more begun to explore some of the dimensions of space that our ancestors had only vaguely comprehended than we began to fill this space with invasions from other planets, mysterious powers out to destroy us, overwhelm us, or perhaps most dangerous of all, enlighten us. And that was one thing we didn't want to take any chances on. <laughs> That would have been just too much under the pressure of existing conditions. So we uh, fill everything with potential menace. And as time goes on, this habit closes around us until 
We, we meet every day with a sigh, what's going to go wrong now? We expect this thing. We have surrounded ourselves with gadgets that fail as rapidly as we pay for them. We never know when we get up in the morning whether the toaster will still operate or not. <laughs> if it doesn't, we just sigh and figure it is another burden that flesh is heir to. Everything seems to want to go wrong. And uh, under this type of thinking, we do become extremely negative. What have we really in ourselves to, to combat this with? First of all, we have in ourselves the power to know that things around us happen to us, but that this thing we call ourselves remains uh, almost eternal as the thing to which all other things can happen. Thus happenings occur because there is something in us to which they can happen. There is within us, therefore, the one thing that gives us essential victory over every circumstance that can arise, and that is consciousness itself. Consciousness presents us with the dilemma. Consciousness abused and misunderstood seems to contribute to the dilemma. But consciousness will survive all dilemma. There is within ourselves this power to be what we will to be. That nothing can occur that man cannot explain or no, nor can any demand arise that man cannot meet if he will use his resources wisely. Against the shadowy form of problem, therefore, is opposed the luminous fact of consciousness. Problems are not conscious. Problems are things outside of ourselves. They happen to us. They may arise in certain of the outer levels of our personalities, that is true. But within the core of every living being is the power over condition. The individual can survive the pain, the individual can adjust the mistake, the individual can learn to do better, the individual can have courage to face the unknown, he can have whatever he demands of this consciousness within him. Therefore, he has resources that are infinite although he is surrounded by finite problems, most of which are comparatively insignificant. That man can be defeated by the world, by problem, by mystery, by anything, is inconceivable. For man possesses within himself the one inevitable factor of victory, and that is consciousness, the power to know, the power to do, the power to overcome obstacle and to adjust consciously and willingly to the facts of universal law. Man has the power within himself to live in harmony with what he knows. Man has the capacity to recognize his faults and correct them. Man has the opportunity to learn about nature and apply this knowledge to his own needs. Man has the capacity to estimate an obstacle. He has the memory to remember that he has mastered other obstacles. He has the power of enlightened faith by which he can have confidence that the full use of his own resources must always be sufficient. Man, therefore, has within himself the element of inevitable and even of immediate victory in many of the situations that most perturb him. It is only when he sells himself short. It is only when he begins to talk about, I don't know, I don't understand, I can't realize, I can't do this, I don't do that, 
This is the type of thing that defeats him. He is defeated when he assumes himself to be helpless. And the only reason he assumes himself to be helpless is that he has never considered carefully the greatest mystery of all, and that is the mystery of himself. The most wonderful thing in all the world and the most unexplainable thing is that man exists. Perhaps the greatest mystery beyond that is that man possesses the consciousness within himself by which he can overcome mystery. The consciousness of man is a mystery. The real fact of his intelligence is a mystery. Uh, the, the, the life principle within him is a mystery. These mysteries he takes for granted, though he does not understand them. Yet the very source of his own life is unknown to him. The processes of consciousness, although we talk about them a great deal, are factually unknown. We have only the possibility of estimating them by their consequences. So the individual who has a negative little mystery confronting him has within himself a tremendous positive mystery with which to solve the little problem that has arisen. The reason we become overwhelmed, the reason we fall apart under pressure, is because we have never recognized our own resources. We have never done anything about these resources. We have gone on using a few faculties in the process of making an economic career. Beyond this, we have done nothing with the potential with which we have been endowed. Now, nature expects us to make a living. There's no question about that. But nature also expects us to use faculties uh, for the solution of personal problems. For the last 75 years, man has been gradually mastering the problem of making a living. He hasn't succeeded entirely, but he is constantly boasting of his own progress in this, real, in this pattern. Uh, our grandparents who worked hard got up at four or five o'clock in the morning and worked until six or seven o'clock at night. The old pattern was from dawn to dark, and they worked six days a week, just as hard as was necessary to take care of the farm or whatever they had. And then they took off a little time on Sunday to drive 20 miles to church in a dashboard buggy and spent most of the day getting there and coming back and the rest having a picnic on the church, church, on the church lawn. This was their lives. They worked hard. And they complained that they didn't have very much time with which to become intellectuals. And there's, there's some ground for this complaint. Also, lighting facilities were not good, and it wasn't easy to become a scholar uh, with an oil lamp and a pair of 98 cents uh, glasses that you bought from mail order house. This wasn't the best way for scholarship. Many times also reading was done by the open fire. There was no other. But by the time the individual had worked the back 40 all day, he wasn't very much interested in scholarship at night, and this was understandable. So one by one, improvements came. Hours were cut down. Machinery was given. Until uh, uh, up to the present time, working conditions have become so greatly improved that our problem now is not how to prevent man from becoming exhausted by his work. The problem now is how to keep him from becoming exhausted by his leisure, which is now closing in on him in every direction. Our grandfather said if he had only had the time to read good books, he'd have been a scholar. Our, his grandson has the time to read good books, but he doesn't. 
because he has now decided that the way uh, of life is to take this leisure and spend it in self-improvement on television commercials <laughs> or watching the Beatles. <laughs> Thus the great labor reform was the mountain that gave birth to a mouse. All of this improvement, which was to make the world better for man, forgot to make man better for the world, and the thing came to nothing. So still, with all the extra time and leisure, we have not realized that we had a parallel program with this one of making a living. We have so many hours to make a living, but we also have this other need that the changes of our patterns of living demand time, energy, and effort directed to self-improvement and to the understanding of the principles behind the practices to which we are addicted. Unless these, uh, this insight is given, we are going to live in perpetual fear. We are going to be afraid of everything that happens because we do not really know why anything happens. And possessed with faculties by which we can organize the universe magnificently as far as its patterns are concerned, we give no thought to it. We keep on drifting along, waiting for misfortune. And by our conduct and our code, we make this misfortune practically inevitable. To take the mystery out of life, we simply have to think a little bit about it. Now, it isn't necessary for the average person to solve all the mysteries of existence in order to be able to delegate a certain amount of intelligent consideration to his problems. The reason why we don't have to solve all mysteries is that at the present state of our mental development, we are not aware of some of the choicest of all mysteries. We haven't even caught up to the fact that they exist. Those we know nothing about, are not aware of, and find in no way related to our needs, are not our problem at the moment. Most of the mysteries that we have to solve are quite solvable, uh, quite within the range of our own abilities. They are simple mysteries, as we have simple needs. But we have to solve some that we do need to understand, and if we do not, the future will always be a mass of uncertainties. As, uh, as you think about today, for example, and uh, begin to estimate the patterns that go to make it up, what are you doing with this day that either solves some unfinished business or else sets a foundation for the fulfillment of some good purpose in the future. Are you building toward a future that you want? And to what degree do you really believe you want the, build, the future you are building for? I've known a good many instances in which individuals have dedicated themselves to a particular purpose, given all they had to it, because in the future it was going to be of the greatest importance. When the future came and they were able to do exactly what they had planned to do, they were miserable. The answer was not found in their own thinking. Uh, and this is a common situation today because futures are very largely planned under pressure. The individual in a situation that is unendurable or unpleasant can, has, on, has only one thought, to get out of it. He is planning to escape. And wherever we have futures built upon plan to escape, we have a doubtful pro program. The reason being that uh, the escape is usually an emotional uh, fulfillment. The individual is not really building something good. He is trying to get out of something uncomfortable. If you do not build, you do not have the building in the future. 
nothing in the term of an avoidance or an evasion uh, can produce very much solid structure some day to come. So that many people uh, face new difficulties rather than solutions because they have selected a pattern uh, which is emotionally intense and rationally deficient. It's another problem that comes into this field of activity is the tired person to whom the future suggests rest. Now, most people think they will settle for that. The individual says, well, if I could get out of this rat race, if I could only get that little cabin on the side of the hill, if I could leave the thundering, blundering world behind and become a kind of a new hermit of a new culture up on the side of a mountain, all would be well. So he tries to do it and, of course, immediately misses the plumbing and uh, in a short time uh, is driven by necessities back to the world he left behind because he is about 500 years late in his pioneering effort. This isn't his answer. Anything which is a running away will never give us a satisfactory future. We may adjust to it. The individual having put all the money he has into the little cabin may have to live there whether he wants to or not. But he is not having that glorious time he expected he was going to have. Or if he thinks he has, he has simply built up some kind of a defense mechanism and uh, thinks he is happy, which perhaps is the same thing. So we do not know how to face this particular value. But generally speaking, the individual who is tired and looks to the future as peace, as release, as the splendid opportunity to do all the gracious things he thought he wanted to do, doesn't generally get very far with this uh, nostalgic approach to things. It is far better in planning a future to be, plan an active one, to plan to do and to be, and to recognize that exhaustion is boredom for the most part, and that the individual who tries to rest finds it more tiresome than any other occupation he can attempt. We are not built for idleness. And anyone who believes that idleness is a reward is gradually demoralizing himself. And that is why the status symbol of being able to be wealthy enough not to work is one of the most dangerous and deadly patterns that humanity has ever devised. The non-working group with this kind of leisure nearly always falls. It cannot remain. It has no uh, roots in life value. So in the problem of the future and of mystery, let us take the mystery out of what happens now, what has happened, or what might happen, by the simple expediency of putting in the place of mystery the common workings of cause and effect of the common consequences of our own conduct and to realize that actually we are a rather neat little package in which each individual lives out the pattern that he has imposed upon himself. And if he is not satisfied with this pattern and doesn't like it, the only way he can change it is by changing himself. If we have a mediocre existence, then the future will be mediocre, and we will have a number of mediocre little mysteries to struggle with from time to time. If, however, we create an interesting personal life, this not only gives us uh, a future, but it also keeps the mind itself constructively occupied. Mysteries have a tendency to become important in minds that are disoriented. The first thing a healthy person wants to do with a mystery is solve it. 
But after a certain t uh, degree of, of mental vagueness has set in, the individual loses the instinct to solve. He loses the faith in himself that he can solve. And very soon the mystery uh, disorients his entire concept of life. If you allow mystery to become strong, lawfulness must depart. If you gradually transform the universe into a mass of miracles, uh, then you lose all power to regulate your own affairs. If you depend upon the miraculous, uh, you then no longer build the basic character patterns which in themselves often work benevolent miracles if we build these patterns correctly. Now there can be a great theological dispute about all this, but I think that the common everyday experience of man is what we must accept as the reasonable way of guidance. Man takes the mystery out of life by imposing upon life a clear concept of what life means. Though one can say perhaps he isn't correct, perhaps it's a little different from the way he feels. This may be, and if he is a broad-minded, intelligent person, he has not put a complete block on the changing of his own attitudes. But he can say, with the intelligence that I now possess, with the degree of insight with which I am now endowed, this I believe to be the correct procedure for myself. And this is why I believe it, because I believe that it adjusts naturally and properly and constructively with universal procedure. Until I know better, therefore, than I know now, I am going to do this thing which I feel to be the best that I know. Some folks have attempted to do this, and they've had excellent results. <laughs> they have found that most of the dilemmas have disappeared. Every once in a while, they may come across something that's a little bigger than the philosophy that they have built. They can admit this, and if possible, enlarge their philosophy to include this newly discovered element. Philosophy, like everything else, has to grow. And when religions, philosophies, and sciences stop growing, they start dying. The same is true of the individual. When he stops learning more, he begins learning less. There is no other answer to this type of pattern. But if we do build a reasonable pattern, we gain support from this pattern. And in this pattern, there is no room uh, for the negative uh, anticipations of evil. It is useless to build, however, simply an intellectual attitude. This attitude must be supported by action, or tomorrow will be full of beautiful attitudes and no good actions. Whatever happens must follow its own pattern. But the person can uh, integrate a positive, simple pattern of life on the basis that if the person uses his faculties as wisely as he can, meets every problem as completely and directly as possible, is not overly self-centered in his decisions, but tries in all decisions not to favor either himself or another, but to favor the truth of the matter. If the truth means a loss to him, then he must lose. If the truth means a loss to another, then that other must lose. But where the advantage of one or the other is elevated above truth, everything loses. So in making our plan, we must have a conviction of value to which we dedicate all of our efforts. 
A good life, well lived, does not mean a life in which we did everything we wanted to do. It is a life in which we wanted to do, so far as possible, that which was really necessary, proper, or next in the program of living. If we try to build a philosophy of self-justification or a philosophy catering to the inadequacies of self as we know it in daily problem, not the real self, but the little selfish self. If we build around this, uh, then naturally we are going to uh, dump a great deal of unfinished business into the future where it will begin to grin at us and look like a demon in disguise. The future is best for those who have balanced their books and go into it out of debt. Out of debt mentally, morally, psychologically, as well as physically. Out of debt because they have paid debt. Out of debt because they have solved problem. We, uh, we cannot face a future uh, safely if we are loaded with personal grievances. We cannot afford to take hates into the future, suspicions, unreasonable doubts, envies, and jealousies. We cannot afford to take psychic sickness into the future if we can possibly get rid of it now. Anything that is not worth living with, we do not want to take into the future and live with it. So every day is an opportunity to solve or get rid of something that we do not want in the future. And as this future looms before us as a great unknown, we have to realize that it is not a great unknown at all. It is not a mystery. It is merely a confusion of things we have dumped into it. And if we have the skill to understand the future, we can organize it. If we have the greater skill to keep it organized by our present conduct, we can move with some serenity from one change of living to another. Always mystery is of one of two natures, either mystery which concerns us or mysteries that do not concern us. We are surrounded in space with mysteries which would be lovely to solve if we could, but which are not immediately necessary to us. For example, whether or not there are any extinct volcanoes on the moon. Now this is a delightful problem. <laughs> And 99 people out of 100 would love to forget all else and dwell on this because it is so delightfully apart from anything practical. Uh, if, they, if they could think about that, they wouldn't have to worry about how they were treating their own families. It, you can forget yourself in a noble uh, exuberance over something that you can do nothing about. So these mysteries are interesting, they are valid. We can conceive practical uses. For instance, we might be able to bump a television program featuring the Beatles off of the moon so that it could cause a riot in Africa. This is, this is a possible utility which we can't lose sight of. But in, in the face of this devastating possibility, we are completely neglecting the very simple matter of what we are going to be ourselves tomorrow. We are trying to evade bringing thinking directly to bear upon self and our own conduct. We have always been desperately desirous of escaping in this way. So there are mysteries and problems and tremendous potentials that time probably will solve, but which have little or no bearing on us. 
Uh, mysteries of this kind, I think, we can ignore for the moment. And we can ignore these great theological mysteries as to which is the most authentic spiritual revelation in the world. I think we can pass this one. We can also at least be friendly and relatively well balanced in trying to determine whether the Godhead is one in three or three in one. I think that we can pass that one. What we're trying desperately to figure out is how to live today so that we can survive tomorrow. And uh, in the face of this, we've got to keep our thoughts pretty well to the facts of living. Face these facts and not try to uh, eliminate the need for this by some grand generalization about intangibles. So get right down as far as possible uh, to the, the problem of cause and effect of your charge account and your credit system. Try to realize that if you abuse credit, you will lose it. That if you push into the future more debt than you can pay, you are going to be worried. And if you push into the future all the unpaid debts of emotional and mental and physical intemperance, then your future is going to look like a very nasty mystery. And it will remain so until you realize that it may be nasty, but it is no mystery because it is exactly what you earned. If we can get down to some pretty solid thinking on this, and can get younger people to do a little thinking in this direction so that as time goes on, they will not overlook the need of regulating their own lives for the futures they hope for. If more people will begin thinking this through clearly, there will be less individuals dropping dead at 48 when they're just beginning to reach the goals they had hoped to attain. They had lived too badly to be able to survive to enjoy their own success. Very near, very careful, very clear, very straight thinking is the help. And this thinking does have deep religious meaning. It is not the thinking of an atheist or an agnostic. It is the thinking of an individual who really believes that God is good and that therefore deity requires that its creation be good. And for man to be good means the attainment of his own potential virtue, and that nature will never rest until he attains this. And the unknown future is simply man still ill-equipped to face his own tomorrows. And the only way he can become better equipped is to make a project out of becoming better equipped. The more he does now to solve and organize his affairs, the less uncertainty lies ahead for him. And as uncertainty is difficult, and a great mental and emotional strain, especially in times like this, it is a, a so very uh, important that we build a character by means of which we can peacefully organize our own purposes, having strength of character to do in our own lives the best that we know. If we have this realization, we gain great consolation, and we also recognize that we are not contributing in any way to further disaster for ourselves or other people. So the, the way to take the mystery out of things is to put the law into them to realize that these things are lawful, which is the thing we don't want to admit. We are afraid that if we sell ourselves, the idea that the universe is honest is going to force honesty on us. And this is something we want to be very slow to think about and would rather allow some of our politicians to decide this for us. They won't. No one will. <laughs> We may have to decide it for them. <laughs> and the only way we can decide it is to build the strength and courage to face these problems with integrity. So wherever 
man's consciousness organizes the universe. Not only is mystery eliminated, but evil is eliminated. There is no horrible destructive power lurking in the unknown. There is no great anthropomorphic struggle between good and evil in space. There is simply this little struggle between universal wisdom and human ignorance. And as soon as we get working on this, we will make marked gain and will contribute not only to take the mystery out of the future for ourselves, but taking the misfortune out of the future for those who must live after we are gone. So let us use insight. Let us put the light of consciousness upon all mystery and see that mystery is only the larger truths with which we are not yet acquainted, but which when we discover them, we will find that they are truly beautiful. Well, time is up, so I think that's all we can do tonight. Now, next Sunday is vacation. This is Labor Day. So everyone is uh, going to have a day off so they can work. <laughs> and we hope that everyone will have a good time doing it. I'd like to announce also that next Tuesday and Wednesday evenings there will be activities here. On September 1st, Dr. Bode is speaking Tuesday. On Wednesday, Dr. Go uh, Dr. Jordan is speaking. And uh, he's going to have an interesting subject, Freudian theory in 3rd century B.C. China. We know the Chinese were very much given to this problem, for they were the ones that said a long time ago that in the old days when men were wise, they slept without dreaming. And that's a beautiful Freudian thought. <laughs> anyway, uh, Dr. Jordan will discuss this matter. I think probably we do the same today, by the way, we made the same achievements. So uh, this coming Tuesday and Wednesday, Dr. Bowden, Dr. Jordan, and uh, there will be no lecture next Sunday, and therefore that the following Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, Dr. Bode and Dr. Jordan will also speak. We hope that you will give them consideration. This is the last time that the exhibition of playing cards will be uh, on display in our library, so we hope you will look it over today and that you will also observe some very interesting things there uh, which you can secure to decorate and ornament your homes or tuck away for needed Christmas presents. You know, if you find a picture you like now, you can always get it and hang it on your wall and then give it to somebody else for Christmas. You can have a double uh, use of this item. In any event, uh, look over the things and see if you don't find something that might interest you. The gift shop has many new cards and gifts, and uh, some very interesting items have appeared, which I think you will be glad to see, so be sure to uh, take a look there. The Autumn Journal is available for delivery. Also note 65 of our uh, mimeograph lecture notes, Love Has No Enemies, one that was uh, considerably requested and therefore that we have prepared for publication. Our next lecture here will be September 15th when the subject will be world problems as projections of the psychic pressures of the individual. Uh, how the individual, whether he realizes it or not, is very largely responsible for the world problems around him not only by contributing to these problems, but by becoming psychically involved in them to the degree that he perpetuates in masses of people problems that might quickly die if man did not morbidly react to them. So we have quite a problem here for your consideration. Beginning next week, uh, the library exhibit will contain a, a group of material on uh, Buddhist arts of Tibet, China, Thailand, and Japan, including a number of items that I brought back from my recent trip. Thank you very much indeed, and hope to see you a week from Sunday.